Hello, welcome to Creekside Online. We're so glad you've joined us today. Starting January 31st, we'll be offering a six-week Zoom class called Beyond Colorblind. If you've ever felt stuck or afraid to engage in conversation about the racial tensions we are facing in the world today, this class is a great way to take a few steps in growing your own ethnic journey and development. For more information, visit our website at creeksideeg.com forward slash next steps. Hey, don't forget, life groups start today. It's not too late to sign up and join a life group. This is a great way to get connected here at Creekside. During this crazy season, it's been especially meaningful to me as our life group has continued to stay connected on Zoom. Seeing friendly faces who love my family and know me has been so encouraging through this season. I love that we have made time to meet each week. If you're wanting to get connected at Creekside, I highly encourage you to join a life group today. For more information, visit our website at creeksideeg.com forward slash groups. Have you ever thought that the Bible is hard to understand? I know I have. On February 8th, we are offering a Zoom class on how to study the Bible. We'll be digging into scripture together and learning. For more information on how to study the Bible, visit our website at creeksideeg.com forward slash next steps. Are you looking for ways to serve the community with your family, life group, or even just by yourself? We have a great opportunity for you. Creekside is the Church of the Week for Love, Inc. in Sacramento, coming up February 15th through the 20th. To sign up and for more information, visit our website. If you're looking outside and the weather is crummy, you know the homeless community is in need of blankets, socks, and even tarps. We are collecting donations through the church office on Mondays, Mondays through Fridays. There's a barrel inside the church office to make it easy and quick for you to drop off your donations. Hey, did you know we have a church mascot? Meet Creekside Candace. Not only is she super cute, but she's gonna be popping up in our social media feeds and maybe even in a few videos. So if you spot her, snap a photo, tag us in your social posts or your stories, and you may even get some Creekside Candace swag. If you don't follow us on Instagram or Facebook, what are you waiting for? If you're new and joining us for the first time, we would love to connect with you. Text the word guest to 888-111. If you're wanting to connect with someone at the church and need prayer, we would love the opportunity to pray with you. Text the words need prayer to 888-111. And if you would like to give to the work that we do here at Creekside, you can text the word give to the number on your screen. Again, we are so glad you're watching with us today. Let's worship together. Make way before the King of Kings. 
Jesus Christ is Lord. All right, let's sing like this. Who can stop? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 No power. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No disease. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. We're going to sing that in a few moments. You know that there is a place for you. There's a place for you in your Father's house. He's building his gracious kingdom. Jesus is the solid foundation, and God is building on that, and he invites us. He invites us into it, all of our you know, our flawed selves, our brokenness, all, all of our, you know, the, the ways that we don't measure up, the pain that we've had, all of that. God uses all of that to build his kingdom. Isn't that an amazing thing? We, uh, we had the opportunity this week to spend some time with a really dear family friend. And uh, she was telling us about her childhood. And it was a tragic childhood. The time in history in which she was born, the place that she was born, the family she was born into, the father that she had, all of that combined to say one horrible message. You are not important. It was just, we were just, my heart broke as I listened to her story. And at 10 years old, her father just abandoned her. Grandma took her in and this wonderful group of ladies, these ladies who followed Jesus, loved her, they, they invited her into their lives, into community, to church, and they began loving her. And God put the broken pieces of her life back together in her teenage years. She found Christ and changed her, restored her. And her life could have gone a whole, you know, one direction, and God changed it. And she, she's lived an amazing life. She is, for decades, she's ministered to children powerfully. She has loved kids to Jesus. I think over 40 years she's, she's taught school. And she's just an amazing woman of God. It's been an encouragement to me, to our family. And we didn't know that part of her story, how God had just redeemed the early part of her life. And that's what he does. That's what he does through you and through me. He invites us into his story. He invites us into the, into the broken places. There are people in your life. There are people in your circle. They're hurting. They, they, may, they may not even be, they may not even be praying right now to God, but you're the answer to their prayer, to their unspoken prayer. God is positioning things, moving things, and you're in their circle. And you can love them in a way that maybe nobody else can, and you can be Jesus to them. You can be the hands and feet of Jesus. We can do that. God calls us into that, like these wonderful ladies did in her life. So can we just be open this week to how God wants to use us? We bring everything that we have. We're not perfect, we're flawed, but we can love people. And in our Father's house, there is a place for us, for you, for me. He's building his kingdom with us. Amazing. All right, let's sing this song. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, 
Welcome to Creekside Online. You know, as an ex-missionary to Italy, I had the privilege of traveling through much of the ancient Roman world, visiting, well, too many ancient cities and archaeological sites to count. Why? Because I'm historically curious. And the New Testament, it was written during the time of the Roman Empire. And I'll tell you, one of the things I discovered in my travels was the Romans really knew how to build. And they were particularly good when it came to building foundations. I mean, underneath their construction, the foundation was the stuff that made the buildings last. Look at this. This is just an image of all the various details and intricacies that went into building a foundation under these Roman construction projects. And by, listen, that was important because even today, some of these buildings that went up over 2,000 years ago are still standing. I remember uh, in my travels that I discovered as I moved around in the Mediterranean world that a lot of modern day roads in, in Europe around the Mediterranean Sea were actually built right over ancient Roman roads because it was determined even in the modern era that the foundations the Romans, the Romans laid couldn't be improved upon. In fact, I remember one time I was down in southern Italy looking for Via Appia, a famous ancient Roman road, and I was driving for miles and miles and miles. Finally stopped and asked someone, I said, I know it's here nearby, I just don't know where it is. And the guy said, you've been driving on the Roman road for 20 minutes. It's only that deep underneath the pavement. We just paved over the Roman road to build a modern road. Man, that's a foundation that lasts. Uh, for 11 years, Michelle and I raised our family in Italy in a place called Faenza. And that, that town was actually built over Roman foundations. It was called Favencia. And they have a local department store. It's kind of like a small J.C. Penney's. 
And I remember going into that store to make some purchases and going to the bottom floor and discovering that that actual, that, that store was actually built over a Roman road. It was anchored to a Roman road. This is what you see underneath the JC Pennies of Faenza. Man, that's a foundation that stood the test of time. You know, Laying a foundation may seem boring. It may seem superfluous. After all, when you finish building a house, right? You, no one sees much of the foundation because you cover it with carpet, tile, paint, or other flooring. But the foundation of a home, it determines whether it will stand the test of time. And likewise, what you and I choose to build our life on will determine whether we stand the test of time. You know, if you want to build a solid, lasting, meaningful life, you're going to have to start from the foundation up. I mean, this is something we sing on a regular basis as Christ followers. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. We could just as easily sing on Christ, the solid rock I build. You see, Christ followers have the privilege of being invited by the living God to build our lives, our marriages, our families, our decisions, our work, our finances, our eternity on the rock solid foundation of Jesus Christ. We build it on his life, his teaching, his example, his sacrifice on Calvary, his, his resurrection from the dead, his promises. Jesus himself says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. I mean, that's why last week, uh, Pastor Joe, he talked about the absolute necessity of craving the words of Jesus Christ, or really the entire word of God, like infants crave their mother's breast milk. It's the food of a healthy soul. You might remember the passage in 1 Peter 2 where it says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. See, the, the scriptures, they're, they're so central and foundational to any spiritual progress that you and I are going to make in life. But in the final analysis, it's not just the word in the book, it's the word made flesh, the very person of Christ who should serve as the only foundation we choose because he is the only foundation that will stand the test of time and eternity. In 1 Peter chapter, one, chapter 2, beginning of verse 4, Jesus Christ is clearly presented as the only foundation that will lead to life as God intended it to be. This is Jesus being actually called the living stone in these verses or the rock or the cornerstone. That agrees with what we see in Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 where he says, no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Yet not all people want Jesus as the foundation of their lives. Now, even many professed Christians today, they really only give lip service to Jesus and scripture being the foundation of they build their lives on. Well, that leads to the text today. Let's pick it up at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, okay? As you come to him, Christ, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house or a temple of the Spirit to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Did you notice that? <laughs> There's a lot of rock talk coming from the Apostle Peter, nine or ten references to rocks, stones, etc. And it makes sense because Jesus gave Simon a new name when they first met. He called him Cephas in the Aramaic or Petros in the Greek, which means rock. Or stone. Peter likes rock talk because Jesus called him Rocky or Rock. 
Now, I've got a little bit of a warning about this passage because it is steeped in Old Testament references. So we're at a distinct disadvantage if we don't know the Old Testament scriptures, but newsflash, there's good news that we can remedy that problem by just becoming better students of the Old Testament. But in this passage, Peter refers to a number of Old Testament rock quotes about the coming Messiah that refer to Jesus as the ultimate living stone because it is upon him, his perfect life, his sacrifice on the cross, his bodily resurrection from the dead that we are called to build our lives. It is equally clear from these verses that any other foundation that we might choose will prove disastrous, which leads to principle number one. You will either build your life upon Jesus or end up tripping over him. There is no middle ground. You will either build your life upon Jesus or end up tripping over him. There is no middle ground. The single most important decision you will ever make is how you respond to the person of Jesus Christ. Have you allowed Jesus to become the bedrock foundation upon which you build your life? And, and maybe more importantly, on a practical level, what does it mean to build your life on Jesus Christ? Well, for one thing, Jesus made Scripture central to everything that he did or said. I mean, he didn't lean on popular opinion in his speaking and his behavior and his thinking or the social media of his day. He didn't let dry, uh, culture drive his thinking or his behavior. His thoughts, he demonstrates this, the human Jesus, his thoughts were shaped by scripture. He marinated his mind and his heart with the Bible and he let the words of God form his worldview. Jesus also made it a habit to spend time in prayer with the Father early in the morning, even before it was light. Spiritual formation takes time. Nobody gets microwaved into spiritual maturity. You know, for us today, we also have the teaching of Jesus, the commands, the promises, the example of his life. Building your life on Jesus means that we take our cues from Scripture and what we see in the person of Jesus. And it's not just a mental exercise either. We also need to invest time praying. We need to invest time learning to listen to the Lord Jesus. Unfortunately, far too many professed believers today are not really taking their cues from Christ. Jesus is revealed in these verses as the living stone, which is precious and chosen by the Father, but misunderstood, undervalued, and rejected by the majority of the human race. And then Peter fires off a bunch of Old Testament quotes, like Isaiah 28. This is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay in Zion a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. Uh, in the verse before that, Peter actually says, uh, quoting Isaiah 28, 15, that the majority response of the human race is this, we made a lie our refuge and a falsehood for our hiding place, but not believers. And then Peter quotes uh, Psalm 118 by saying, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And then he goes back to Isaiah and he quotes Isaiah 8, he will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. All Messianic prophecy. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. So once again, principle number one is that you will either build your life upon Jesus or end up tripping over him. There is no middle ground. You know, the nation of Israel, by and large, rejected Jesus as their Messiah because he just wasn't what they expected him to be. They wanted a powerful king to destroy the Gentiles, to make all the Jewish people rich. They, well, they wanted a political Messiah. And so they tripped over him. They stumbled over Christ and ended up despising him, rejecting him, and even killing him. And in the end, the scripture tells us that if you reject Christ, as your foundation stone, it will lead only to your own spiritual ruin. And that's what happened with Israel. Israel, as a nation, was completely destroyed 40 years after rejecting their Messiah, completely razed to the ground. You know, for the last 20 centuries, people have been profoundly divided over what to do with Jesus Christ. 
Uh, I will confess to you that I still don't understand Jesus fully. I've been following him for four decades, but I will tell you this also. Surrendering to Christ has brought me great joy, peace, significance, and stability. You know, like a builder discards building materials deemed unsuitable. That's what happened with Israel and their Messiah. Even today, many people view Jesus as kind of strange or out of step with our times, a relic of the past. And so they discard him or set him aside to their own ruin. We also, as human beings, tend to reject Jesus because we can't control him or bring him over to our own agenda. And so the majority of human beings end up tragically tripping or stumbling over Jesus to their own ruin. Now that Jesus has been revealed to the world, he stands in the way of all people. Those who refuse to come to him will sadly be judged by him. To refuse to embrace Christ is to choose to stumble over him. So let me just make a pastoral appeal to you. Open your heart and your mind fully to receive Jesus Christ and to receive him right into your life as Lord and Savior. Do it now as your forgiver, as your leader, as your foundation stone, as the rock you build on. Don't put that decision off. You could just call out to him now and say, Jesus, I need you. Save me. Come inside me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. Give me a new start with you. You know, not only is this stone passage steeped in Old Testament references, it's also built on very intense personal conversations that Jesus had directly with Peter. You see, when Peter first met Jesus, the Lord gave him a new name. I already told you that. It's Cephas in the Aramaic or Petros or Peter in the Greek. And again, Peter just means rock or stone like we have here. All right. A rock or a stone that you'd find out in the field. And what I think is fascinating is that Peter probably viewed himself more as the jello man, right? The wiggly guy, the, the classic evangelifish. He probably didn't see himself as a rock solid follower of Jesus. But what Peter didn't understand was is that Jesus gave him a name that was based on what Peter would become. It's what Jesus saw in Peter's future. He was predicting that Peter would become a solid rock leader. He saw where Peter's life was going. Principle number two. Jesus sees you for what you could become under his lordship. Jesus sees you for what you could become under his lordship. Even when no one else can see potential in you, I want you to know that your Lord does. He sees it and he wants to bring it out in you if you'll let him. If in Christ, we are no longer simply products of our past mistakes, failures, and sin. We can become projects of his grace and his active involvement in our lives. Give Christ access to the control center of your life and you will become a new creation. That is Peter's story. Peter went from being this, think about it, this impetuous, unpredictable, superficial, hot-headed jello man. <laughs> Classic even jellyfish, right? Without backbone. He went from that to becoming a rock solid Christian leader who fed Jesus' sheep and offered spiritual insight and stability to countless people. Even today, 2,000 years later, through his writings, Peter still speaks to us. At another time, about midway through Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus took his disciples aside and he asked them who they really thought he was. Now, the multitude had all kinds of opinions, even like today about Jesus. Most of them were wrong. But this is where Simon Peter is the mouthpiece of the apostles. He steps forward again and he makes what's called the great confession. And he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, once again, in response to Peter's bold confession of faith, Jesus takes Peter's name and makes a play on the words of it. So I want you to follow this. Look at the screen here. Okay, this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16 at verse 17. He says, Blessed are you, Simon, of Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. In other words, Christ's true identity. And then Jesus says this, And I tell you that you are Peter. And he uses the word Petros, which is stone, field stone, right? You are Petros. And on this rock, he uses a different word, Petra, which is more a rock formation from which you get stones. 
Upon this Petra, a rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades or hell will not overcome it. In other words, Peter is the huge foundation stone of the confession of Christ as Lord. That's the foundation stone upon which we build our lives. And Peter was simply one of the living stones that Christ would use to create a whole new movement on earth. But what's probably more important for you and me today is that every person who comes to Christ in repentant faith is destined to become another living stone to be built together with others of like mind into a spiritual temple, a corporate human house where God can dwell. That's where we come into the concept of living stones. Let me just say parenthetically that I don't know for sure when, this, when all these current COVID-19 restrictions are going to be lifted in California. You know, it looks like that day could be within sight and hopefully it's before summer, right? But even when we do get the green light to be able to fully utilize our campus for ministry again, we're, we're going to continue offering Creekside Online because we believe that God wants us to better engage digitally with thousands of people seeking God whom we may never see in person. But for most of us, I hope what we're about to see in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 awakens a desire in us to commit to literally, physically coming back together with other believers in person to do what is described in these verses. Over the last 10 and a half months, our culture has grown accustomed to a high degree of retreat and isolation, which has resulted in a lot of mental health problems because that is not how we're designed. And we might be tempted to continue on like this, with this kind of lifestyle of retreat and isolation when the dangers of COVID-19 are actually lifted in the near future. But I want to challenge you based on 1 Peter chapter 2 to choose to respond differently from those who don't know Christ or appreciate what Jesus does as his body gathers physically together, brick by brick, living stone by living stone, to be his spiritual temple on earth through which praise is offered and we collectively proclaim him to the world. God's design since the time of the church's birth back in Acts chapter 2 was to physically draw the body of Christ together at least once a week for instruction, worship, fellowship, and then to scatter us into the world six days a week on mission. Now, I understand that some of you live far from Elk Grove. You can't come. Or perhaps you have a physical limitation which would make it really hard to return in person when COVID-19 risks are behind us. But I want you to look again at the New Testament rhythm that we see continually. In, in, in 1 Peter, we see this. In Hebrews 10, we see this. It's to gather the first day of the week and then scatter on mission for the other six days of the week. To gather and then to scatter. That's the New Testament rhythm. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. As you come to him, there's motion. You're coming to Christ, right? The living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built. Like living stones, you're being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus binds us together and then he builds us together. This is what the author of Hebrews talks about in chapter 10 as well when he writes, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as we see the day approaching, the day that Christ returns. Boy, what a great segue to just promote life groups. You talk about a great application for just getting into a life group here at Creekside. You've got to think about this, among other things. It is so clear that we are to practice one another Christianity from these verses. We are to engage in Christian community, brick by brick, living stone by living stone together. We can't win if we don't participate. And the we component of Christianity is huge. So whether in person or online... We have to figure out how to make a vital connection to Christ's body on a regular basis. 
And just as Jesus is called the living stone in him, God considers all believers living stones. We are like building materials. Think of it like a brick. We're like building materials for what Jesus is creating brick by brick, living stone by living stone here on earth. And that leads to principle number three. We belong to each other because we belong to Christ. We belong to each other because we belong to Christ. Christianity by nature is community because our God is a communal God. We are individually living stones, yes, which God is fitting together into a spiritual temple. But we only find our true place and calling in this world when we allow God to build us into something bigger than ourselves. In other words, solitary religion is an absurdity to God because he created the church so that we wouldn't be isolated or orphaned. I was reading a commentator this week, uh, William Barclay, who said this about this concept here. He said, so long as a brick lies by itself, it is useless, but it becomes of use only when it is incorporated into a building. So it is with the individual Christian to realize his destiny. He must not remain alone, but must be built into the fabric of the church. We have such a beautiful picture here in 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 2, excuse me, of God building this huge temple of living stones upon our common faith commitment in Christ. And the purposes of this human temple are clear. It's to bring worship to God, but it's also to bring witness to the world. In 1 Peter 2, 5, we read again, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house or literally into a temple of the spirit to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. You know, God, God actually set aside the Levitical priesthood of the Old Testament, and instead he drafted every believer in Christ to serve in a holy priesthood which offers spiritual sacrifices. And since Jesus fulfilled and then replaced the Old Testament system of animal sacrifices, Christ's followers are now to offer acceptable spiritual sacrifices in his name. Well, what does that mean, acceptable spiritual sacrifices? Thanks for asking. The New Testament actually answers that question. We are to offer the following to God in the name of Jesus. For example, we are to offer our confession when we sin, our faith instead of fear, our bodies and living sacrifices in obedient service, our minds for thought transformation or the renewal of our minds, our spiritual gifts to edify other believers, our time in meeting others' practical needs, our material assets to further kingdom purposes, our lips in praise and thanksgiving, and our lives in giving our faith away. I've given you scripture references for each of those lists on the sermon outline, so you have them. But let me, let me let you in on a secret, because sometimes remembering lists is hard. But let me just say that when you are actively seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and when you're act actively seeking to be guided by the Holy Spirit, the things that I just listed off will come naturally to you in a supernatural way. They're going to supernaturally overflow or spill from your lives as the Spirit of God lives in you. You know, after studying scriptures and walking with Jesus Christ for over four decades now, one of the greatest spiritual principles that I've ever discovered is that what you do comes from who you are. I think that the world around us has this all backwards. I think the message we consistently get from outside the church, outside of Christ, tells us that our worth and our identity, they come from what we do, our performance. But God says, no way. You can't build a life on that. So God says, when you believe and follow my son Jesus, I gift you a wonderful new identity. That's what we see in verse 9 and 10. Look at this. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. There's a lot there. But let me give you principle four, okay? And then we'll build on it. What you do proceeds from who you are. 
Identity determines behavior. What you do proceeds from who you are. Identity determines behavior. Honestly, I think that our culture has so confused people today about who they are, even with gender fluidity and all of that stuff, that it shouldn't surprise us that we have strange behavior all over the place today. Look again at verse 9. See what it says about born-again believers. But first note this. All of these descriptors are very Jewish in orientation. It's like Israel failed to live up to their destiny, their identity. And so God put them on the bench and he just kind of passed over them and passed on that identity to the new Israel, in a sense, the church. We're on the playing field now and we have this identity that Christ follows we carry into the way that we live. And though each of these titles is true of us individually, I want you to also notice that they're also stated collectively in the plural. This is not just me. This is us. And look what it says. It says in Christ, and then it lifts us off. It says, we are a chosen people. You were picked by God. I was picked by God for an amazing purpose. We are a royal priesthood. This is a cool one. Only one tribe out of 12 in Israel were priests and they were the Levites, right? But now God has actually chosen to let all believers in on this royal priesthood, right? We all have unique access to God. It's interesting. In the Old Testament, they had a priesthood. In the New Testament, we are the priesthood. And we have a couple of functions. We have an upward function, which is to direct our praises to God. But we also have an outward function as a royal priesthood to help people connect with God. We are mediators of God's truth and his love. This is a fascinating little tidbit, but the Latin word for priest is pontifex, which literally means bridge builders, because we are bridge builders as priests. And another thing that's interesting is that royalty and priesthood are never mixed in the Old Testament. You have kings and you have priests. Never did they mix. But in the New Testament, royalty and priesthood are mixed. We are now royalty. We are a royal priesthood. We follow King Jesus and are therefore royal members of his family. We are also a holy nation. Different from others. Kadosh, holy, right? Set apart as a people who are pure and beautiful to serve like mirrors so that others can see God and clearly be drawn to him. And I, we need to notice that you cannot have a positive effect on others the way that God commands us to unless we continually pursue holiness. And then lastly, we are God's special possession. Our value to God is through the roof. I'm going to give you an illustration. Let's imagine that I have this, this feather pen in my hand, right? And it's the kind that you would dip in an ink quill and you would sign documents with. Maybe it's about 150 years or so old and I would sell it to you. How much do you think it's worth? Uh, $20, $50 maybe. But what if I told you that that particular pen was used to sign the Gettysburg Address by Abraham Lincoln or to emancipate the slaves? Then all of a sudden, its value goes up infinitely because of who it belonged to and what he did. You are God's special possession. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10, it goes on to say that we have been delivered from darkness. Look at this. We've been delivered from darkness into wonderful light. We've gone from not belonging to anyone to being the people of God, belonging to God. We've gone from wrath, rejection, condemnation to mercy, forgiveness, and salvation. And all of these lofty identity privileges, they also carry a very big responsibility. They inform us as to how we should behave. Look at verse 9. It says that you may declare God's praises, His excellencies to the world around you. So any spiritual success that we might have in this lifetime is completely dependent on having a clear concept of our true identity. We have to remember who we are. You know, when my kids were young, uh, they memorized the Lion King movie. Hopefully you've seen that too. It's the iconic Disney film, right? And we learned all the songs. They knew all the lines. They could quote them before the characters quoted them. And I know there's a little bit of animism in there and all that. But the story goes that the father, who's the king, has Simba in mind, his son to be the future king. And then Simba's deceived by another lion called Scar. And Simba ends up wandering away and living like a warthog or a prairie dog, like Pumbaa or Timon. He eats worms and he's forgotten his identity. 
And then there's this moment in the movie where his father speaks to him and with the James Earl Jones voice, you might remember this, where he says, Simba, remember who you are. He's calling him back to his true identity. I want you to watch that video clip. That's not my father. It's just my reflection. No. Look hard. You see, he lives in you. Simba, you are more than what you have become. You must take your place in the circle of life. How can I go back? I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Remember who you are. Oh, Christ follower. You've got to listen to the voice of your father. Not my voice, but the voice of your father. Remember who you are. Remember who he has made you to be in Christ when you believed. We've got to remember that. And there's a couple of other sobering facts we need to keep in the forefront of our minds. And our first one is, we as Christ followers, we still live in enemy territory. As temporary exiles. That's what the last couple of verses of this passage say. And secondly, all God's privileges carry a very big responsibility that we reveal our God to a lost world. In 1 Peter chapter 2, at verse 11, it says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, there it is again, exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. In other words, avoid anything that is self-destructive behavior. On the contrary, he says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And he's just quoting Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 15. Let me give you the last principle, okay? Every Christian or every Christ follower is an advertisement for God, an advertisement for God. Every Christ follower is an advertisement for God. Essentially, what God has done is he's taken a group of people who were outsiders with no rights or claims on his grace, and he's placed us at the white hot lava center of his program of salvation for the world. We're plan A. He's got no plan B. We are walking, living, breathing billboards for God. And his desire to be lifted up and glorified through us individually as believers and collectively as a church. So now it's our turn to be living stones built on the living stone, doing what God has called us to do because we believe what he said we are. Let me pray. Father, today we just want to thank you for the way that you have lavished on us a spectacular identity, given us a rock to build our life on your son, Jesus. And now, Lord, I pray, first of all, that we just believe that, absorb that identity, trust it, lean into it. And as a result, we let your spirit overflow from our lives to represent you well, to continually lift up praise to you, but outwardly to also reflect you well to the world around us. God, Thank you for these ancient lessons that are so pertinent today, coming from the pen of the Apostle Peter, but really from your Holy Spirit. Would you teach us? Would you mold us? Would you direct us? Would you form in us the very life of Christ through these studies and through our daily walks, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking
sinking sand. On Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone.
We're so glad you're here with us today. I wanna to give you a blessing on the count of three. Let's put our hands together. One, two, three. May you seek to be filled with the Spirit and remember our identity is found only in Jesus. Pack that up, put it in your heart, and have a great day.